Hi, I'm Craig, and I want to show you a little trick on how you can store your aerosol cans so that they keep for long periods of time. If you ever bought a can for a project, use it a couple of times, set it on the shelf, and you come back months later to use it again, and it's dry. You can't get any paint out. You can hear the paint inside, but you can't get it out, so you just have to throw it away. Well, you're just throwing your money away. Don't do that. Keep your money in your pocket, okay? This little trick will show you how you can store that can indefinitely and use it just as if it were brand new. But before I do that, I want to give you a brief history on how the aerosol can evolved. It's kind of interesting, and how the can works internally so that this trick makes sense to you, so you understand it. All right, sit back and enjoy the show. Like every great invention, the aerosol spray can was developed over many years, and with the research and hard work of several great inventors, one building upon the other. The origins of our modern day aerosol canister go back as far as the late 1700s. The French were experimenting with self-pressurized carbonated beverage canisters. In 1927, a Norwegian engineer by the name of Eric Rothheim patented the first aerosol can and valve system that could hold and dispense products. He was granted a U.S. patent in 1931. Every great invention has its time, and unfortunately the market just wasn't ready for aerosols yet. So Rothheim's invention had very limited success. So he sold the patent to a U.S. company for 100,000 Norwegian crones. That's equivalent to 70,000 U.S. dollars, and that's a lot of money for the 1940s. Even though Rothheim didn't see huge success with his idea, it was the first real predecessor of what we now know as the modern day aerosol spray can. During World War II, the U.S. government funded research and development to find a portable and lightweight way for the U.S. soldiers to carry and use pesticide to kill malaria carrying mosquitoes in foreign countries during that war. In 1943, Lyle Goodhue and William Sullivan, using Rothheim's principles, came up with what would be the forerunner of the modern day spray can. The propellant gas used was fluorocarbon. Their can was refillable, not disposable, and the valve was a screw type, which could not distribute short bursts of product. In 1949, a Bronx machine shop proprietor by the name of Robert H. Applenalp invented the crimp-on spring-loaded valve, which enabled liquids to be sprayed from a can using pressurized inert gas in short, usable bursts. It was the combination of the inventions of Rothheim, Goodhue, Sullivan, and Applenau, which created the first true disposable spray canister that we know of today. Also in 1949, Edward Seymour was the first to add paint to an aerosol can. It was actually his wife's idea. The first color was aluminum. The basic mechanical design of any aerosol can is as follows. You have a round canister with a concave bottom. The concave bottom is to prevent the pressure from blowing that out. The top is called the valve cup. And the little button that you press is called the actuator. The hole where the product come out, comes out is called the orifice. And some actuators can be rotated left or right and that determines the volume coming out. And some actuators will actually have a little rectangular plate and the rectangular plate can be either horizontal, which means your pattern will be horizontal, or you can turn it vertical, and the pattern will be vertical. This can doesn't have either one of those, but that is a, an option. The part of the actuator that goes down into the can is called the stem. Just inside the can, there's a little black rubber gasket, which seals the can. And then now we have the valve assembly below. This is actually the, the valve cup. This is the spring, and then we have the spring cup above that. Below the valve assembly is the straw which dips down into the product that is called the dip tube. And last but not least, we have that all familiar rattling sound which comes from the marble inside which is actually called the P. Okay, so the chemical propulsion system consists of two things. Product, which comprises about three quarters of the can. And then we have propellant, which lies in the headspace. Now there's two different types of propellant. There's inert gas, 
and liquefied gas, which is more commonly used today. And we'll talk about those in a few minutes. But the mechanical actuation of the system remains the same for both. When you press the actuator, all of this remains the same, regardless of what type of propellant you have. Okay, first we'll talk about compressed gas. Chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, were the first and most commonly used propellant for many years. During the 1970s, it was realized that this chemical caused damage to our Earth's ozone layer, and by 1978, they were starting to become banned throughout the world. By 1989, they were completely banned, and it's a good thing. The most widely used replacements are hydrocarbons, propane, n-butane, isobutane, dimethyl ether, and methyl ethyl. The challenges with these chemicals are that they're flammable, and none of these chemicals are safe for human consumption. So for foodstuffs, such as cooking oils and whipped cream, nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide are used as propellants. Medical aerosols, such as inhalers, use hydrofluoricanes. All of these are simply compressed gases which push the product out of the can. That pressure is finite and will reduce as the product is used. Look at compressed gas as a balloon crammed inside that little tiny can. At first, when the balloon is compressed real small, it presses on the liquid inside and pushes it through the dip tube very hard and very fast. As the liquid is released, the headspace for the balloon becomes larger and the pressure reduces as the balloon is allowed to become bigger. And the other method that we talked about was liquid propulsion. And one of the advantages of using liquid propulsion is that the pressure maintains a constant as the product is being used. This is the same principle as in liquid propane or LP on your gas grill. It's pumped in under high pressure. This pressure causes it to liquefy and maintain in a liquid state. As long as it's not allowed to expand into a gas, by releasing that pressure, it will stay a liquid. When the valve is open, the pressure starts to reduce, thus causing the liquid propellant to do what's called boil. It doesn't really boil, as you and I know it. I mean, it won't burn your hand or anything like that. This boiling process simply means that the particles be begin to break free from the liquid and become gas which is released into the headspace and create pressure on the contents of the can. This increased pressure pushes the product through the dip tube just like before and some of the product propellant is mixed with the product itself and leaves the can as you spray. When it does the liquid propellant rapidly turns into a gas again and enters the atmosphere. The ratio of the propellant to product depends upon the chemical makeup of the product itself, the use, and the desired effect of the delivery of the product, i.e. the fine mist, or a thick foam, or anything in between. Okay, now let's talk about the paint. That's broken down into two parts, basically. You have solids and solvents. The solids are what comprise the color when you spray, and the solvents are what liquefy or break down those solids to allow them to come through the dip tube. The solids settle to the bottom like a sludge when not in use and the solvents rise to the top and then the gas is in the headspace above. This is the main reason for the pee in the can so as you shake it and you hear that rattle this helps to mix up the solids and the solvents into a thin sprayable consistency. So one of the culprits for a clogged can is the dried solids in the dip tube. The solvents evaporate away and just leave the solids in that orifice and then down through the dip tube which clog the can. There are some misnomers about how to prevent or open these clogs, so let's begin with what not to do. Rinsing with water is not going to do anything because the spray is not water soluble. Never stick anything down in the orifice or inside the can. It's way too dangerous, even for me. Capping the can will also do nothing. The clog occurs inside the tube and the actuator. Soaking the actuator in solvents may help dry paint in the orifice, but the idea is to prevent the clog, not unclog the clog. And finally we have storing the can upside down. I don't know whose idea this ever was, but it's not going to do anything. How'd you like that? Wasn't that interesting? I learned a lot myself when I was doing the research. Okay, so here's the long-awaited trick. When you're finished using your can, you've got product coming out, all you have to do is turn the can upside down 
and you spray it until it runs clear. You'll see the dark paint or whatever color the paint is and you'll hear a tone change. It'll go from low to high and you'll see the color run clear. Like that. What you're doing is you're turning the headspace upside down so instead of the headspace being in the top of the can the gases are now in the bottom of the can and that dip tube as you recall goes to the bottom and those gases are blowing any residual or leftover solids out the dip tube out the actuator and out the orifice and basically clearing it out so that you can set it upright set it on your shelf come back and use it at any time but one thing to remember is when you do come back to use it whether it be a week a month or whatever later shake it really well because as you recall there's that sludge or the solids settle in the bottom so if you just pick it up right off the shelf and use it you're going to suck those solids right into the tube and it's too much for that orifice the orifice is way too small for that so shake it up mix it really well and that trick will work like a champ for you now one thing i do want to mention is there are on the shelf out there products with what's called an any angle spray valve and this trick will not work for those because the valve is specifically designed to spray upside down and they do that for a purpose and that is if you're underneath a car or something like that or spraying furniture upside down it'll continuously spray so unless you need that feature keep an eye out for it don't buy it because you can't store it for any period of time it will dry up on you but it is a good feature to have so I hope you enjoyed the video I hope it was informative to you I hope you can use that trick and save some money keep your money in your pocket Check back next time. There's going to be lots more videos with lots of easy tips. Thanks.